The following review is intended for entertainment purposes and targeted for adult fans of the series. I mean, I do get it, just... Wow. Wow! Wow! <laughs> wow! Hello there, heroes! I'm the Orange Ranger, and welcome to another Power Rangers Beast Morphers 2.0 episode review. When Super Ninja Steel gave us Sheriff Skyfire, that was just a one-and-done thing. Just a way to burn up a little more Sentai footage, and he was never even thought of after his one episode. Reflecting that there's been at least a little bit of a change, we get to see this metal hero for a little bit longer. That's right, we've got a second episode featuring Captain Joe Chaku. So let's take a look at the 11th episode of Power Rangers Beast Morphers 2.0. You might be wondering if I'm going to get tired of that gag. Nope. Sorry, that joke writes itself. Please make sure you subscribe to my channel to see all of my videos. Ring the bell, get your notifications set up so you're notified of whenever I post brand new videos, such as these Power Rangers Beast Morphers 2.0 episode reviews. And if you'd like to lend any financial support to my channel, please consider checking me out on Patreon or Coffee at Orange Ranger Videos. We get a previously on segment, even though this, technically speaking, is not a two-part episode. I would imagine that they did it because anybody tuning into this episode that didn't see the previous one wouldn't have the first clue who Captain Chaku is. He's putting out a fire at a Morphex Tower as the Rangers arrive. Rijak has apparently been on a hit-and-run operation lately, stealing Morphex barrels from various towers and always slipping out just as Chaku arrives. Chaku says that stopping Rijak is G5's primary responsibility right now. In the previous episode, he gave a little speech about how Rijak is basically like Rancic for Time Force, the very last criminal that they have to deal with. So they are sending him his spaceship, the Reptilla Beast. Not sure how he got to Earth without his spaceship. We've seen that he can teleport, but anyway, Commander Shaw is with the Rangers for the exact same reason that G5 sent Chaku to Earth without his spaceship. The reason in the story is about to become clear, but in context, her presence there makes no sense. She offers Chaku a formal position with Grid Battle Force once the whole Rijak thing is under control. Excuse me, uh, the, uh, the did you just say? Okay, so Chaku is a member of another police force, the G5 Galactic Patrol or whatever they're called. G5 is the part that I remember. I'm not saying that it's unheard of for one police precinct, for lack of a better term, to request an officer from another precinct to transfer over to them. But I would think that usually you would check with that other precinct first to make sure that they're okay with the offer. Otherwise, if the officer asks to transfer and they say no, it can harbor resentment within their ranks. Get on with it! Good point, MPG. By the way, if you're feeling sick under that mask, don't go riding around with any Secret Service agents. You hear me? Anyway, he hesitates, saying that Earth is very far from his home galaxy. Earth is a particular planet, you could be slightly more specific about where you're from, Chaku. But if it's for the greater good, he accepts. If it's for what, Chaku? Roll credits. In the Crystal Dynamics dimension, Scrozzle is putting away the last of the more effects and says that they're now back at tippy top shape. You know, I kind of riffed on it last week, but worse writers wouldn't really pay any attention to the power levels of the villains. They just generate their own energy somehow. I've actually really enjoyed that a recurring story element for the villains has been what their power level is. That they continue to run down on energy, and every once in a while hit on a plan to get some more effects and top back up. Anyway, Rijak is suddenly working on a totally different plan, tunneling into the Ranger Vault from underground, thanks to coordinates given to him by the Robos, who Evox brushes off. They repeat how they plan to betray Rijak when this is all over. Ben and Betty take Chaku's luggage. Hang on. Where did Chaku's luggage come from? I thought it might have been on that ship that G5 is sending to Earth, the Reptilla Beast, 
but spoilers, that ship has not arrived yet, and if Chaku has just been teleporting around, how does he have luggage, and if he only just accepted the position with Grid Battle Force, why did he have his luggage with him? Anyway, before MPG comes back, the two of them then get eaten by Chaku's pet Venus flytrap monster. But unfortunately, Chaku gets it to spit the two out, covered in orange mucus. That was a great scene. The real great scene is what follows. Chaku pulls out a little Star Wars hologram communication disc and calls his daughter. Her name might be Starlight, he calls her that at the end of the call, and it might just be an affectation, but I like to think that it's her name because it's a pretty name. It just goes to establish that Chaku really misses home, and Nate happens to see this walking by because for some reason Chaku's door never closed. Nate tells the others Devin surprised that Chaku has a daughter because he thought that Chaku was a robot, but Steel says, hey, robots can have daughters. Though actually what Steele says is people can be both, which kind of sounded like he was saying people could be both robots and daughters, which I suppose technically is also true. My point is the line was badly written, but Steele does make a good point. Nate says that it's sad that Chaku would agree to work on Earth when he has a family so far away that he misses. Zoe wonders why Chaku would agree to work with them if this is the case, and they all say that they're basically wondering the same thing. You're stupid. Not only did Chaku already explain why he's taking the job, but it is, and I cannot stress this enough, literally the title of the episode, The Greater Good. The Greater Good. Chaku did not implicitly say that he had a family, but he did say that his home galaxy is quite far from Earth, but if it's for the greater good, the greater good. he'll do it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. The Rangers then hear a rumbling sound coming from underneath the floor and decide to go get Captain Chaku and investigate despite the fact that the sound is coming from the room that they are standing in. Okay, Devin does say that there's a drainage ditch underneath that room, so they're probably going to the entrance of that to go down and investigate, but you don't want to leave anyone in the room itself? You trust Ben and Betty's rope throwers that much? The Rangers and Chaku destroy the Vivix and Putties doing the mining work and then attack Rijak. But this time, Rijak just lets them swing away, and they do absolutely no damage. He's got thick skin, an ability he apparently developed between episodes, because that was not a thing last time. Nate and Steel hold the monster so the Rangers can get their licks in, Chaku finally doing an enforcer strike, and the Rangers using their Beast X cannons. But Rijak is not destroyed, though he does teleport away. The Rangers go to report to Commander Shaw about the attempted invasion, but Nate pulls Chaku aside into another lab. For some reason, he's decided this is the point that they need to discuss Chaku's daughter. It strikes a chord with Nate because his parents worked overseas while he was growing up, and he didn't get to see them much either. Why wasn't Nate with them when he was growing up? Did they work in a war zone or something? But Chaku says his going home is about more than just serving the greater good. The greater good. Captain Chaku removes his helmet and reveals to Nate that he's a member of the friggin' Borg Collective. Okay, he's not a Borg, obviously, but he is a cyborg and has a very Borg-looking eyepiece over the left side of his face. So what happened to him? Some kind of terrible accident that required the cyborg replacement of human parts? No. The G5 police did this to Chaku intentionally to help him fight crime better, likely also enabling his transformation. I get it. I don't get it. I mean, I do get it, just... Wow. Wow! I did not see this coming at all. And by the way, kudos to those of you who saw the international airings for not spoiling this, because this reveal hits like a truck if you don't know anything about it. 
Chaku has literally sacrificed his humanity to serve the episode's title, The Greater Good. The Greater Good. That's the issue, by the way, why Chaku actually took the assignment on Earth. He doesn't feel like his daughter is going to accept him because he's no longer the man that his daughter remembered as her father. Nate assures him that she's going to accept him no matter what, but he just walks away. Is so dramatic. Back in the Crystals for Good Spiritual Energy dimension, Ryjack says that it was just bad luck that the Rangers found him just before he was going to get into the Ranger Vault. All he needs to do is try again. Evox presses him a little, saying he should bring that famous weapons collection of his to the Crystal Dimension so they can all use them to defeat the Rangers. But Ryjack says no, that weapons collection is staying on his ship, which is hidden somewhere on Earth. So he just revealed to them that his ship and his weapons collection are hidden somewhere on Earth. Whoops! Evox needles his pride, saying that obviously he's too weak to defeat the Rangers all by himself. And he leaves to prove Evox wrong. Evox says that once the Rangers destroy Ryjack, they'll find the ship and get all of those weapons. And then they do this. <laughs> Commander Shaw tells the Rangers and Chaku that Ryjack is back and they head out to fight. That wasn't very long, so to avoid another that was a great scene, two quick notes. Number one, I saw some people on Twitter mention that in the American footage, Chaku's suit seemed a little bit flat, silver, or gray while it's shinier in the Gavin footage. To be honest, I didn't notice until that was pointed out and it really still didn't bother me. The suit looks absolutely fine in American footage. Number two, when the Rangers leave, there's a guard standing outside facing the door. And the way the camera is focused, for a second I thought that guard was going to be some kind of evil spy that snuck into the lab or something. Good guys confront bad guy, another Devin one-liner to add to the compilation video, and the Rangers morph. They adopt a very excellent strategy, completely disarming Ryjack. They knock away the reanimizer gun, though we see it fly up into the air and it just never seems to come down, and knock away his sword and shield. Nate says he's all out of toys now, but Ryjack says he has one more he's been saving for a special occasion. A little something he found in the ruins of Andresia. So I guess Orion really hasn't had any luck rebuilding his world. The device makes Ryjack grow. Nate wonders how that's possible. For a show that's been so focused on ranger history, apparently these rangers haven't really studied it. Scrozzle is smartest one there is. He teleports in, grabs the reanimizer, which I guess did eventually hit the ground, and leaves. Wonder what plot threads that might lead to. The rangers form the Beast X Ultra Zord, but have no luck with Ryjack, who's even able to flip the entire thing over. He then blasts the Ultra Zord with some kind of energy that freezes up their systems, requiring a complete reboot. Fortunately, just in time, Chaku's ship, the Reptilla Beast, arrives. It transforms into a dragon, which I guess technically speaking could be considered a reptile. Really, though, all he does is buys the Rangers time to reboot their Ultra Zord. They get flipped again, but this time think to actually shoot Ryjack while they're in the air, and then come down with a kick. Cheetah Beast Blaster, Ultra Strike, and Ryjack is destroyed. Or Ryjack eliminated, as Devin says. As the Rangers return to the lab, there's a different guard outside the door. It's a guy this time. And thinking about it, I guess it does fit with keeping the vault more secure, though that threat has now been eliminated, so moving on. Chaku says with Ryjack defeated, his duties with the G5 police are now complete, which I guess eases that whole transfer thing. So he's now officially a member of Grid Battle Force. Shaw says before he begins, they have a gift for him, and Nate takes him to a different lab. Nate explains to Chaku that his morphing device combined the rangers with animal DNA and combined Steel's robotic body with his DNA, making Steel half human. He has now reprogrammed the device to remove the robotic parts from Chaku's DNA, allowing him to be fully human. 
Chaku asks if that's even possible. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. I mean, it really shouldn't be, right? The key word in what Nate was describing to Chaku is combination. Now, I do think that the machine would be able to separate the robotic parts from the human parts. It's kind of just a reversal of the process. But wouldn't you need to recombine some human DNA back in there so Chaku would be a complete person? That would make for an interesting story kicker too, by the way. Say if Nate stepped in there to provide some of his DNA, giving him another brother. Ooh, or how about Steel, echoing what Nate did for him by stepping in and providing some of his human DNA. Credit to the writers, they do throw in a line from Nate about DNA rejuvenation, so I guess the parts that had been replaced by the cyborg parts just grew back somehow, but anyway, Chaku is a real boy again and somehow got Orion's jacket out of the process. After a joke from Steel trying to claim the Reptilla Beast, Chaku warmly thanks them all for their help and leaves to reunite with his daughter. What a nice, warm-hearted way to wrap up the episode. Or at least it should have been. This really should have been where the episode ended. They had a joke. They had a nice, warm, family-feeling moment. Oh, by the way, Chaku also thanked Nate specifically and said that he knows that Nate's parents do miss him and are proud of him. But no, let's check in on Ben and Betty. Chaku let them keep the Venus flytrap thing for whatever reason, and they somehow discovered that it's able to eat trash and just like a snake with bones, spit out the recyclables. Although apparently this isn't the healthiest thing for it because it then throws up on them. That was not funny. That, however, would be a really stupid ending to a pretty good episode. So instead, they tack on a second warm, fuzzy moment. You remember how I said that the Enterprise-D traveling at warp 9.9 .9 would take over 30 years to cross our galaxy? Well, apparently Chaku's ship or teleportation or whatever goes a heck of a lot faster than that because he's already home. The message is from him and his daughter, his daughter thanking the Rangers for sending her daddy home to her. Aww, let's throw some shades. Episode 11, The Greater Good. The Greater Good. Pros, Chaku's entire backstory and characterization using anything to push the story forward and the sense of family. Cons, the Reptilla Beast really wasn't necessary, Rijak's defeat was anticlimactic, and Ben and Betty were painfully tacked on. Beast Morphers took Sentai footage we weren't even sure would be used and crafted one of the best stories it has done thus far. The Greater Good, the greater good. gets 4.5 shades out of 5. This was a classic Beast Morphers episode. The story wobbles a little bit here and there. There are a couple of things that I can nitpick in that way that I do, but there's a really solid core. The action was good, and Chaku was just an amazing character with a really surprisingly deep backstory. I'm not expecting to see him again, though it would be great if we did. The implication, again, is that his cyborg bits are what enabled his transformation into... What exactly was that suit actually called? Captain was his title and Chaku was his name, right? Who knows? Not me. Are we done with team-ups for the Beast Morphers? <laughs> oh, oh no, heroes. We're just getting started. Let's take a peek at the 12th episode of Beast Morphers 2.0, Finders Keepers. Zoe accidentally captures an innocent after mistaking them for a foe, and the situation goes out of control as Evox's forces strike at the same time. Now, the Rangers must join forces with another team to defeat newly resurrected old foes and save the innocent from their capture. That is going to do it for another Power Rangers Beast Morphers 2.0 episode review. Thank you, heroes, so much as always for watching. Now that the video's done, you can let me know what you thought of this episode, as well as my review of it, down in the comments below. And while you're down there, make sure you smack that thumbs up button and let me know that you enjoyed this video. Until next time, heroes, may the power protect you. Commander Shaw is with the Rangers for the exact same reason that G5 didn't send the spaceship with... When I was writing the script, there were several times that I tried to call him Gavin, and it's 
might happen here too. Commander Shaw is with the Rangers for the exact same reason that Gavin came to fuck. Anyway, you know, I kind of riffed on it last week, but, uh, blah, blah, by the way, but spoilers, that hasn't arrived. I'm doing this again. And has a Borg like I blah, 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 over his blah, 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 blah. and a large portion of his face, including his left eye, has been replaced by a very Borg looking like implant into his actual doing this take again. <sighs> With a very Borg looking eyepiece in his left thing. You! And the left side of his face has been replaced with a very Borg-looking eyepiece. Once again, I keep running into a roadblock, I get past the roadblock, and I don't remember the rest of the take. Captain Chaku reveals his helmet. He's not the man that his daughter thought he was, and she remembers the fu Fortunately, just in time, Ooh, or how about steel? Echoing what Nate did to, did 